Hello, Sunset Church, and welcome to our Sunday online experience. My name is Sabrina, and we're so glad that you chose to spend your Sunday with us. At Sunset, we want to be known for our generosity, so would you do me a favor? Grab the link below and text someone in your circle right now. Don't hold back the good that God has for them and help us bless someone today. And if you're new to this space, we just want to say hello and welcome you. We would love to know where you're tuning in from, so give us a shout out in the chat. We have our online hosts in the chat ready to connect with you. And speaking of connecting, there's no better feeling than staying connected even through a global pandemic. Whether it's through our virtual lobby, our CS group, or our CS outreach experience, we would love to connect with you at our upcoming CS meetup. And if you want to know more, we got you. Our meetup is simply a time to virtually connect with our lead pastors and a few of our key leaders. Our meetup takes place once a month and all you gotta do is text CS Meetup to 97,000 and follow the prompts. Even though we physically can't be together, we can all remain connected. All right, church, will you join me as we open our hearts and celebrate who God is and all that he's done for us during this season. Let's stand together as our CS worship team leads us into an intimate time of praise and thanksgiving. What is up, church? We are so excited to be back. For some of us, gathered together again. We're trying something new this morning, but how many of you know God still shows up in our worship no matter what it looks like? We're gonna sing one of our favorite declarations of faith. Come on, let's go. I give you glory. I give you glory for all you brought me through, Jesus. And now I'm ready for whatever. Moving forward to follow after you, and now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Yes, I am. It's His presence. Come on, Your presence is an open door. We want You, Jesus. We want You, Lord, like never. up praise this morning. In every season, your grace has been enough. Yeah. And I'm believing that the best is yet to come. Yeah, come on. Hey. The cross before me, my whole one thing to And in you, Jesus, the best is yet. Oh! 
sing that. Come on. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. It's your presence, God. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Say that again, so come. So come now, Lord, like never before. We want you, Jesus. So come now, Lord, like never before. So come now, Lord, in my family, like never before. Yeah, so come. So come now, Lord, like never before. Rain down, rain down on me, Jesus, like never before. We want a fresh touch, God. I want to experience you like never before. I want to feel your goodness like never before. I want a fresh encounter like never before. So come now, Lord, in my life like never Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Come on, we declare it. All the earth, and all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
Come on church, even when we're not physically gathered in a building, we believe that God can move by the power of His Spirit. And speaking of building, as of today, we have started our relaunch phase one as we gather in person. We're closely monitoring all the county regulations and social guidelines, but at the same time, we're so excited to host you. So if you just missed today's opportunity, head on over to our website to reserve your spot for our next in-person gathering. And next week, guys, you're gonna wanna tune in as we have a special Sunday in store for you. We have a four by six lineup. Come on, four of our servant leaders, six minutes, they have a special word they wanna share just for you. You're not gonna wanna miss it. And as we continue with our collection of talks, it's been so helpful and transformative, church. So can I really encourage you to lean in and apply the all that God has for you as Pastor Ali concludes with love after lockdown. Good morning, church. Anybody excited for church today? Come on. Uh, we are nine months in a pandemic, and I'm still excited because I see God doing amazing things in our church. For those of you who are new, my name is Ali. My wife and I, we started Center Set three years ago with a dream that God just gave us to create a place that not only Christians could grow in their faith, but unchurched people could explore in their faith. So if you're new to church, first time, I hope you're going to realize you're going to be encouraged, inspired, and challenged to be the best 30 minutes of your week. And we are in the middle of the conclusion of a collection of talks called Love After Lockdown. And really the heart behind this collection of talks was a burden that my wife and I felt five months ago, the, the dark side of this lockdown. Yes, we want to bend the curve. Yes, we want to reduce the number of hospitalizations. But the effect is not just economic, it's also relational. Depression is up, suicide is up, drug use is up. And it's hurting our marriages as well. They're unavoidable, but it's, it's real. Divorce is up. Infidelity is up. And in this hopeless situation, God wants to speak hope and encouragement to some people today. For the last five weeks, it's been nothing but relationships. Week one was to all the men. Week two was to all the ladies. Week three was one of my favorites to all the singles in the church. Last week was to the married couples. And today I'm going to speak into no matter what your relationship status Bay, partner, it's complicated. Today's going to help you build love in lockdown. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to settle there. We're going to use this text from Moses for our conversations today. This is Moses speaking. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, and to keep His commands decrees and laws, then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, and I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life. I love that Moses gives us the answer to the question, to the test. Choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Last week was about staying married in lockdown. Today is building it. We don't want you to just settle, just get through this thing, hope you don't get divorced. No, God wants your marriage to be stronger coming out of this thing than going into this thing. And if you bow your heads and close your eyes, I got a word for you today. God, thank you so much, God, that, that you are in this split space, that you're speaking to us. You are changing marriages one couple at a time. That, that you are still in the business of doing miracles, God. We just pray, Lord, for the 49ers and for our marriages, God. That if you can do a miracle with the Niners, we would just have more faith for ourselves, but we just believe it, God. Jokes aside, silliness aside, God, that there's life and death before us. Yeah. And God, you give us the power and the tools, not just to get by in our relationships, but to thrive and to build love. That we would love our spouse more next year than this year. Yeah. More today than the day before. We just believe it and everybody said, Amen. everybody said, Amen. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but you are the product of your choices. Mm -hmm. Who you are today are the choices that you made yesterday. Mm -hmm. And the better choice I make today, the less regret I'm going to have tomorrow, amen? Mm -hmm. And often in the context of relationships, uh, we don't realize that we make decisions out of impulse. I want it now. We make decisions out of like emotions. I, I, I feels good, so I want it. Mm -hmm. 
Or we make decisions in our relationships out of infatuation. She's a hottie with a body. So I want a good Friday night, not a good legacy. But often what you don't realize is the decisions that you make, they can't just be good or bad, moral, immoral. They gotta be wise. They gotta be healthy. And listen, I'm all about the butterflies. I, I, everyone loves those, but listen, butterflies fly away. So you gotta learn to make decisions, not based on emotions, but principle. And I, I remember seven years ago, just it, like it was yesterday, I could picture my pastor to my right and my family, my friends to my left and my beautiful bride before me. And we said, for rich or for poor, hopefully you're rich, because even if you're poor, I'll still be with you. But hopefully, you know, uh, until death do us part. And I remember declaring my love for her. And often we think of those are the decisions that matter most. Those are the decisions we focus on. But it's the daily decisions. Like the, the wife that I choose to love today is going to determine the marriage that we have tomorrow. And what we don't realize is the decisions I make today are just as powerful as on that marriage day. And I was thinking about, as I was writing this sermon, man, Pastor Yaz and I have been dating for nine years. That is crazy to me. Some of you are like, you still date to the yes. And trust me, if you don't, someone else will. So date your spouse. It keeps it fresh. And I, I love this, this conversation that Moses is having in Deuteronomy 30. He has led the Israelites for 40 years out of the land of, of bondage, out of slavery in Egypt. And for 40 years, Moses was by himself in the wilderness. And for 40 years, he lived as a prince in the Egyptians. He's 120. He's about to die. These are his last words to the people that he loves. And he's saying, God has placed before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Have you ever been in high school where you have that one teacher that everybody loves? Because this isn't just like what you go through class. He wants to help you succeed, right? So you go on an exam, you're like, I don't know. He helps you solve it during the exam, right? That's what Moses is doing. He's saying, pick life. He's giving you the answer during the exam. He's not talking about like morality, like life and death, or like good and bad. He's saying that the decisions that you make are deeper than that. This is about placing God first in every decision that you're taking his plan versus your plan. Mm -hmm. And when you follow him, even when you don't feel like it, it's gonna bring life and life abundantly. Anybody want that today? So today is really about answering three questions and I'm gonna whisper the answer in your ear. Choose life, choose life, and choose life. And the first question that I want you to write down is this. Will you choose to listen before you speak? Will you choose to listen before you speak? It doesn't matter the status of your relationship, how long you've been dating or married. Everyone can grow in this area. And listen, I didn't say listen instead of speaking. I said listen before you speak. Implying there's an order of communication that you listen first and then you speak. It's not a coincidence that God gave us two ears and one mouth because he wants us to listen twice as much as we speak. And often it's very easy for me to look at Pastor Yaz and be like, She's a woman. She speaks 20,000 words a day. I'm a guy. I speak 7,000. It's just male and female. We're different. No, but it's deeper than that. Yeah. Communication is, is more than just male and female. It's personalities. Yeah. I can tell you, Pastor Yaz and I, we take in information so differently. Like Pastor Yaz, when she reads, she wants to touch a book, write in a book, feel the book. <laughs> I want to put headphones in and go for a walk because I want to listen to that book. When I'm creating a sermon or writing something deep, I want the room to be silent. I want tranquility. Yeah. Pastor Yaz, when she's creating, she's got the office in the background. If it, when that runs out, it's friends, like chaos is going, I can't. The way we do communication is totally different. And often it's our differences that make it hard to communicate. You've heard this leadership axiom, everything rises and falls on leadership. I'm telling you, in relationships, everything rises and falls on communication. And it's our differences that often make communications difficult. It's easy to be like, I don't want to put in the time. I don't want to put in the energy. It's the, these differences cause us to be divided. Actually, it makes life exciting. I love doing life with Pastor Yaz because she sees the world so different than me. She brings a perspective and a communication style that adds life to our relationship. Like when I walk into the room, I see black and white. Pastor Yaz, she sees the room in color. When I walk into a room, or whether we're a furniture store, or buying car, I want function. Is this going to add value? That's all I care about. Pastor Yaz looks at the aesthetic quality. Is it going to be beautiful to look at? She adds, she creates a world that doesn't just look, that doesn't just function good, it looks good. And my question for you is, do you want to grow in your communication? Because everything rises and falls on your communication. But how will you know unless you ask? How will you know what you're 
your spouse values it unless you're learning to listen. Listen to me, church. Listening leads to learning. So often when we enter a new season with our spouse, a new season or new relationship, we walk in like this with our hands over our eyes because we're assuming about the other person. We think they're the same person in this season as they were in the last. Pastor Yaz is not the same woman she was when I met her nine years ago. Thank God. I'm not the same dude that Pastor Yaz met nine years ago. I used to wear baggy pants and now I wear Lululemon <laughs> pants. And I have so the, the pockets on them and I love them. And Jesus, said, you can make fun of me. I still love you. But one of my mentors told me this. He's like, I've been married for 40 years to six different women. And they've all been the same woman. She kept changing and I kept loving. Marriage is like that. And it's a tragedy when spouses stop dating because you're not pursuing anymore. You're not learning anymore. Do you find your communication breaking down? See, often we argue about money and sex and kids, but the central thing is always communication. Do you want to get better in your relationships? Do you want the communication to get better in your marriage? Every hand I bet is going up. The solution is simple. Stop assuming. So often the arguments, the fights, the missed opportunities for joy about what God wants to do in this new season of life is because we assume that our spouse is the same person today that they were yesterday. That the same desires, the same dreams, the same aspirations that they had when we first met them are there today. This is the beauty of pursuit. You're learning who they are. You're learning as they change. So thank God they're changing. I'm a new creation. I'm a, I'm a brand new person. And I'm not who I should be. But by God's grace, I'm not who I used to be. And, and healthy things grow. So thank God your spouse is growing and changing. So stop assuming Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, says it like this. He says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Let me kind of clarify what fool means. Like, oh, like, Mr. T, I pity the fool. Like, this is not that. <laughs> in the book of Proverbs, there are two people, the wise man and the fool. The fool is the one who rejects God. He's the one that says, I don't want to listen to God. He's not teachable. He wants to do things his way or the highway. And so because of his lack of teachability, because of his pride, he's foolish in that he's ignoring God. The fool speaks, the wise man listens. The fool only wants to be heard. The humble person wants to understand. If everything rises and falls on leadership, if you're stuck in a relationship rut, and you're in confusion, you're in division, you're in fighting, the solution is simple to stop assuming and to listen. And the bridge to clarity, the bridge to unity, the, br the bridge to having oneness is not you speaking, it's you asking questions and learning. Yeah. When you ask, you begin to understand their position. Yeah. And often, we, we've heard this leadership axiom, people don't care what you say until they know that you care. Mm -hmm. That isn't just true with the strangers. That's true with our spouses and those that we love the most. Do you find yourself having conflict in communication? Do you want a better marriage? The choice is yours. God gives you life and death, blessings and curse. Will you choose to listen before you speak? And before you just say, I want to use this next time I get into a fight. No, no, no. This is like in every area. When you're having time with the kids, when you're at the dinner table, when you're sitting on the couch asking how their day was, when you're in bed and it's the end of the night, Listening is an art form that builds intimacy and grows your love for one another. What does your spouse think about kids? How does she want to raise them? What are the dreams and desires that are in your heart that weren't there last year? I found that there are things that God has placed in my heart that were dormant when I first married her. And every couple of months, things start bubbling up to the surface that I never knew. And it's the constant pursuit, not of who she was, but who I'm trying to discover her to be. And if I can give you one simple clue, if you take your phone, not an Android device, a real iPhone, <laughs> being honest, if you do this, I'm telling you your yeah. conversation is going to be way better. Yeah. I, I'm just speaking out of my own mistakes. Often Pastor Yaz would say things multiple times because I was so busy doing this. What, say that again? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I was listening, honey. Can you say that again? But when I started doing this and I started doing active listening, which is different than listening, active listening is when I repeat back to her what she said to me. So many times by me repeating back to her, she's like, actually, now that I heard you say it, 
It's more this. And there's this depth. There's this knowing that I never knew because I got rid of things in my hand. Will you choose to listen before you speak? Question number two, if you're taking notes, and this one's juicy. Will you choose God's design for sex or your own distortion? Let's start. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. And right, we, we sing these songs, we watch the TV shows. Everyone is talking about sex. Why is it so polarizing to have this conversation in the church? Well, let me acknowledge it. Sometimes people feel judged. They feel shame. They feel condemnation. This is not a house of shame or condemnation. I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad. Listen, you are welcome. You, are, you can belong before you believe anything that we teach today. But... I'm speaking to the Christians for a moment. If you love Jesus, if you're a follower of Christ and you love not only him, but his word, listen, the designer has a design for the gift that he gave us. Sex is not dirty. Sex is not gross. Sex is a gift. Amen. All the men say hallelujah to that, right? (laughs) But it's often when God gives us a gift that we don't use it right, that what's supposed to be helpful becomes hurtful. As you look at the scriptures, every time God gives a gift, he gives it with boundaries guardrails, things that you shouldn't do. And when you do do them, the blessing becomes a burden. Think, for example, when you're driving to Tahoe, it's late, let's say it's snowing, and the visibility is low, you are grateful that there are guardrails so you don't drive off a cliff. No one gets out of the car and goes, dang it, Gavin Newsom, first the mask, now you're trying to control me. No, you're thankful for those things. In the same way, the Word of God operates like that in our life. It's guardrails. You know, you know, God's not trying to control you. He's trying to make you enjoy the gift so it's a blessing and not a burden. It's helping you and not hurting you. And so often we don't realize the designer has a design for his gift. The gift is to be enjoyed. Sex is to be enjoyed in the context of marriage. Does that mean you can have sex outside of marriage? Yes, but it's dangerous. And I want to look at the, the very first couple because this problem of, of sex being distorted, what is the root source of it? In the first, in the Genesis chapter two and three, I've been talking about these two chapters for the last five weeks in a row. I'm telling you, go read chapter one, two, and three, and every relationship book will pull principles out of these three chapters. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then He made man. He said, Let us make man in our image and give us dominion to rule and reign. And then He created this heaven on earth, this place called Eden. He said, I want you to expand this garden so the whole world is like heaven. Expand this place. And, and, and Adam and Eve, they're, they're, they're working, they're, they're tilling, they're, they're expanding this place. And then one day, the enemy, the, the Satan comes and he speaks to Eve. Yeah. And his conversation with her is the same conversation we're having in the church about this subject. He comes up to Eve and says, did God really say? See, the enemy always wants you to question the word of God. Almost once a month, almost multiple times a year, I sit down with people in our church and they question what the Word of God says about an area that God makes very clear. You know, I look at the Hebrew, I look at the Greek, and uh, I think it says something different. I have a college degree, we're, we're, we're advanced, we're, we're, this is 2020, this is so archaic. I don't think God meant that. And what they're really doing is exactly what Satan did several thousand years ago. He's questioning the Word of God. But it goes further than that. He goes, you know why, Eve? God doesn't want you to eat that, app, that fruit. We don't know if it's an apple. I know cartoons do, but it's not. No one knows what fruit it is. He goes, because God knows if you eat from that fruit, you'll know, the good, you'll know the difference between good and bad, and you'll be like God. He's questioning the goodness and the motivation. God's not really for you. God doesn't have your back. He doesn't love you. He's withholding from you. If you do it this way, it's way better than God's way. What Adam and Eve did, they both ate from that fruit. And immediately, what God promised would happen, that God said, if you eat from this fruit, there will be death. Not not physical death. They didn't die from poison. But they were instantly separated from the life of God. In the same way that a branch, when you cut it, it's still physically there. But it's dying. Because it's not connected to the source of life. Adam and Eve were separated from God. And they felt shame. And they felt fear. And they, not, they didn't just run from God. They ran from each other. And this has been the, the picture of humanity ever since. That people come to church and they still feel shame. They, they come to church like, how are you doing? Like, good. Even though they cuss each other out on the way to church. But they put the mask on because they're afraid of you seeing who they really are. 
And I love this picture of what humanity is in their brokenness. It's God pursuing us. Not when we fixed our life and took a shower and then came to church. God visits us in our brokenness, in our deadness. He's pursuing and loving us at our worst. Anybody grateful for that kind of God? And what's so crazy is that God goes looking for me. He goes, Adam, where are you? And Adam's not very smart. He goes, we're hiding. <laughs> it's meant for you, right? He goes, why are you hiding? Because like, I ate the fruit that you told me not to eat. He goes, why did you eat it? It was a woman. She made me do it. And God addresses the woman. He goes, why did you eat the fruit? He goes, it was the snake. And ever since, couples have been blaming one another for the, the relationship problems. Because they, they do more talking than they do listening, if you ask me. And then God does something that's shocking. He takes them and he kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. And it's easy to look at this from modern eyes, like pff, cancel culture. God is so judgmental. Look at, look at the way he's treating his children. No, this is an act of love. Because now everything in the Garden of Eden is perfect except for Adam and Eve. And if they eat from the other tree, which is the tree of life, they'll live in a state of brokenness forever. He's kicking them out for their own benefit. And this line about the guardrails that God gave us about sex has not stopped since that moment. That, t- that Jesus in John chapter 4 declares who the serpent was, the one who questions God's word, the one who questions his motivation. He says he is the father of lies. Which means Satan doesn't speak English. He doesn't speak Spanish. No habla espanol. I'm learning. He speaks lies. And when you know if you're a follower of Jesus or if you follow Satan, are you a liar? Because you're looking like your dad. And it's crazy because Satan, he wants to remove those guardrails. He wants to say they don't exist. It's not that big of a deal. And he'll lie to you before sex, he'll lie to you during sex, and he'll lie to you after sex. And I see this all the time in our church. I've been pastoring for over a decade. I see it with single people. They'll sit in the front row in the church, the first two rows will take a notes, like, I've given my life to God, yeah! But they have this tick. Because they're shaking on the inside. Like, Pastor Ali, like, I, I, I need to have sex. These showers aren't working! And they had like this, this, they always say, I'm boiling on the inside. I'm not sure what, what I'd call that, but that's not passion, right? Like, you look different, bro. Like, calm down. And what, what Satan does to him, he lies. You need to have it. You have to have it. You're missing out. He goes, it's not that big of a deal. And the moment they, they, they have sex, they go, oh my gosh. You're a mistake. This is the biggest thing you've ever done. And Satan lies to them before and lies to them afterwards. Because he's trying to get God's gift which was meant to be helpful, and he wants to use it as a tool to hurt you. See this in the area of porn. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. You're by yourself. No one knows what you're doing. And see, c- people in our church, especially during this pandemic, it's, it's, it's happening all the time. And what it is is one broken person watching another broken person. Let me give you a mental picture. If you're thirsty, you don't go to the toilet to drink water, but that's what porn is. You, you, you're trying to Fix that brokenness on the inside of you with someone else's brokenness. And I'll say, it's not that big of a deal. You need that release. And often I hear as soon as people do it, they feel dirty and worse afterwards. And this is what culture wants to tell you is that sex is just physical. But it's deeper than that. It's at the soul level. Sex is emotional. Sex is spiritual. And it's physical. And culture will say, if it feels good, do it. That's a terrible way to live your life. Because I was driving with my family the other day and someone cut me off on the one-on-one and I felt like doing something. You know what I'm talking about? If I did it, I'd be in jail right now. It's a terrible way to live your life. And culture will tell you, if it feels good, do it. Your desires, your urges, your temptations, your sexuality, that's what defines you. Let me tell you, those things do not define you. Your sexual organs don't even define you. You are defined by your Father in heaven. You are a child of God. You you are a brand new creation in Christ. And the truest version of yourself is not what your emotions and your feelings and what culture tells you. It's who God says that you are. So quit letting culture define who you are and let God, your creator, tell you what the design was for. And the the problem with the, the enemy, he doesn't just do this with single people. He lies about the guardrails, about what sex is, not just to single people, but to married people. See, when you're single, you crave sex. When you're married, you neglect sex. Don't get religious on me right now. Come on now. We're, we're at Center Set. If you want the, the, the nice service, come to the 8 o'clock service. 
Pastor Alec, we don't have an 8 o'clock service. I know. Just go, though. Because I'm not changing in this service. And God gave us sex as a gift. And often we overemphasize it before we're married, and then we underemphasize it after we're married. It's the work of the enemy. Let me give you three reasons why God gave us sex. Number one, for procreation. The first commandment in the Bible is go and be fruitful and multiply. Think about that for a moment. It's not don't do this, it's go have sex. Can we just pause and say, our God is an awesome God. That is amazing. I don't know who's an atheist, but you have not read the Bible. Number two, it's for pleasure. Apparently, if you do it right, it feels good. That's, who knew, right? Number three, it's for protection. It's a bonding agent. And when God says the two shall become one, the one the, in the Old Testament is the word echad. It's like this glue. There's the one time the soldier was fighting and his hand became echad with the sword because it was so cold, his hand froze. And there's this oneness that happens when you become one physically, you become one spiritually, and two become one. And actually Paul, who wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament, he says the only time you shouldn't be having sex is when you're praying. All the men at home, I'm telling you, this is your life verse from this moment on. You're welcome. Read this verse with me, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time. They may, you may give yourselves to prayer and fasting and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because you lack self-control. Let me give you an image of what it looks like when couples n- neglect and minimize the importance of sex in their marriage. Imagine you're sitting in bed and your, your wife or your spouse on one side and you're on the other and Satan's in the middle. And he wants to separate you two. And God created sex, not just for procreation and pleasure, but as a bonding agent. And, I, and even though I said often in communications, it's not just male and female, it's like we're different personalities. But in my home, this is about me and Pastor Yaz. Whenever Pastor Yaz asks me a question, I don't know if I'm just simple or more mature, the answer is always sex, right? Just being honest. Right now? No, 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 later, later okay. Is now a good time? No, 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 okay, you're right, you're right, right, right. The kids are asleep. Now? No, no, you're right, right. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. <laughs> You can't get this preaching anywhere else, right? But, but the idea is God gives us guardrails and this gift becomes beautiful. But when you don't do it his way, it becomes harmful. And often what we don't realize is the enemy he wants, he doesn't create sex, he didn't design sex, but he wants to pervert it, destroy it, and take this blessing and make it a curse. And it's often, listen, the thing that's supposed to enhance our life, when you don't do it God's way, it defines your life. And God defines you not your sexuality or how you like to have sex. You have to choose though, life and death, blessings and curse. Will you choose God's view of sex or your own distortion? Question number three, and this is the last one. This one is short, but it's very powerful. Will you choose to like them as much as you love them? Especially around the Thanksgiving holiday season, you'll be surrounded by relatives that you have to love, because they're family. But you don't really like them. Maybe that's just me, I'm just being honest, I'm the pastor, (laughs) judge me, I'm okay with it. Uh, But I'm Silicon Valley, born and raised, on the playground is where I spent most of my days. You gotta understand, I grew up in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, Madonna and Michael Jackson were big in the 80s, and then the early 90s, it was grunge, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and then hip hop blew up. Biggie Smalls and Tupac. So even though I listened to hip hop, I didn't live hip-hop. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you listen to it. It was on every baseball game we'd go to. would be blasting. And then imagine, I'm this like hip-hop kid, and then I go to college at San Luis Obispo, which is like literally white America, like the central California. Everyone's a farmer, and everyone listens to country music. It was like, I went from like rice rockets to F-150. It was such a culture shock. And I remember going to the clubs at 18, 19-year-old in the Bay Area, Totally, did. now I'm going to country clubs. I remember going to a line dancing uh, party. I was like, what? I sat in the corner, freaked out, not knowing. Like when you go to a Catholic church, they give you a hymnal book, page 350, read from here. Everyone was dancing the same way and no one gave me, I'm like, how did you guys know how to do this? It was scary. And even though I was like surrounded and engulfed in country music culture, especially at San Luis Obispo, it, I don't like country music. I just like tolerate it. Right? There's some, 
some musicians that like I like occasionally listen to. <laughs> but there's one guy, he wrote a song, says, I know she loves me, but she doesn't like me anymore. Mm-hmm. Name is George. I think I, that, that, that word, that phrase is so powerful because love, I think, is the most powerful force in the universe. And love is a choice. Love is a decision that you make, but liking someone, it's what you feel when you're around them because you enjoy them. And the heart that Pastor Yaz and I have was not just for you to get by in your relationships, like get from one fight to the next, one drama season to the next. Let's just get through Corona. Let's just stay married. No, God wants to build love in lockdown. He wants you to flirt with your spouse again. He wants you to enjoy your spouse again. Not like the relatives on Thanksgiving where you love them because you have to, but you don't like them. God doesn't just want you to love your spouse. He wants you to like them. The question you got to answer is, do you want a good marriage or a great one? I remember when I stood before my friends and family with my pastor on one side and my friends and family on the other, and I was declaring, I'm in love with this woman, but I was also declaring, I'm in like with her too. And that's the, the paradigm shift that you got to, do you want to like your spouse as much as you love them? Well, how do I do that, Pastor Alley? Simple. Solution is gratitude. See, the longer we're with someone, the more we emphasize the things that they do wrong. See, when you appreciate something, it grows. When you depreciate something, it gets worse. Do you want to grow in your relationship? Do you want your love to grow? And not only your love, but your like. Appreciate them. That's the power of gratitude. It's so simple. But people will say, she knows I like her. But she needs to hear it. Because Jesus says, out of your heart, the mouth speaks. So if you ain't saying it, I question what's inside. So show it, yeah. express it, yeah. write it, yeah. say it with cards, say it with flowers, say it with gifts, constantly show it. Because the Bible says the joy of our Lord is our strength. And I'm telling you, when you get gratitude, you're going to find joy. And the joy of your marriage will be your strength. Yeah. The question is, you got to choose though. Do you want life or death? Yeah. Blessings or curse? Yeah. Do you love your spouse and not like them anymore? Mm-hmm. How do you change that? comes through gratitude. I, I love these series and I, I, I love these collection of talks. And, but I got to be honest, as a pastor, I feel this tension. I only get 52 Sundays a year with you. And I love, you know, having these conversations about love after lockdown. But more than principles and more than giving you marriage books and going to, I think you should do all of those things. But more than principles, I want to give you a person. And if you fix your relationship with Jesus... All of horizontally, vertically, I mean, all of your horizontal relationships change. That when he becomes first, all the other dominoes fall into place. That when I love Jesus, I become a better spouse. When I love Jesus, I become a better dad, better son, better father, better employee. That when I fix this relationship, all my others change. So more than just good principles and questions, what I think you should do, the question is deeper. Do you know him? Because here's the thing that maybe you've never heard. God doesn't just love you. He likes you. And sometimes we think that God's, the way he thinks about us is the way that we do with Thanksgiving meals. I got to be here. I got to sit next to this person. God doesn't just tolerate you. He doesn't grit his teeth when he's around you. He has chemistry with you. He loves you. He wants to spend time with you. And read this verse with me. It's in Zephaniah 3, 17. It's our last verse. The Lord your God is in your midst. I love that verse. Because it says, no matter where you are, no matter where you're going, God's with you. Some of you are going to leave this church at home experience. You're going to go for a a meal before they put it back in the red tier. Please go out. (laughs) You're going to go for a walk. You're going to spend time with friends. Maybe watch Sunday night football. No matter where you are, you don't need to wait another week before you feel the presence of God. God is in your midst. He's with you right now. That's good news. He says, a mighty one who will save. One translation says, God, who is mighty to save. He doesn't just want to save your soul. He wants to save your marriage. He wants to save you from shame, save you from condemnation, save you from your idea of what sexuality is. He wants to save you because he is mighty to save. And then it says, and he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you, quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. 
Often we think about in church, us singing to God. Ethan leads us in worship every single week. I'm so grateful for him. But this verse says that God is singing over us. I, my, my daughters and I, every once in a while, we'll, we'll put on YouTube, and I don't know why, they are in love with NSYNC. I, I showed them one song, and I showed them the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. They don't like the Backstreet Boys. They clearly NSYNC is the winner. And those, my daughter's four, she sings along in the car. And there are times like, Daddy, sing with me. And I sing NSYNC songs to my daughter because I love her and I like her. And God is singing over you. Not because He doesn't just love you. He wants to spend time with you because He likes you. And He gives you that choice. Do you want life or death? Blessings or curse? Will you choose Him today? But I thought you said, Pastor Ali, the, the, the everyone was kicked out of Eden. That is the good news, but the, that is the bad news. The good news is that 2,000 years ago, God became a man. And on a cross, He threw open the gates of Eden again and says, we're back in business. And when I walk back into the Garden of Eden and through a relationship with Jesus, I'm not walking in on my merit, but what on Jesus did for me. Yeah. So I can walk in full of joy, full of confidence, knowing that my God loved me enough, not just to die for me, but He likes me enough to sing for me as I'm walking in. This verse is a picture of the last days, that when we're at the, the supper table and God has this meal, hopefully there's Taco Bell, and he's literally gonna grab the mic. Say, witness Houston, sit down. Celine Dion, let me do this. And Jesus is gonna sing over you because he loves you. Yeah. And he likes you. And he wants to spend time with you. Now let me just quickly pray for you because I just believe that this is a holy moment for many of you. God, thank you so much for those that are watching from home or listening online to our podcast, that they, they recognize that they, need, they wanna grow in their relationship, God. They want their relationship with their spouse or their partner or bae to get better, God. And those questions, will we listen before we speak? Will we, will we view God, sex your way, God, or our own way? And will we not just, will we like our partner as much as we love them? God, I just pray for every marriage, married couple in our, in our church, every relationship in our church, God. That Holy Spirit, you'd speak to them to take one next step. One small thing that they can do. One minor thing that they can improve so the relationship can get better, that love can actually be built during this pandemic. And I just pray prophetically over those who are far from you that they felt your love this morning. They felt that you're a loving embrace, that you've been drawing them, you've been pulling them. I want to speak specifically to, to those listening online, you watching at home, this YouTube experience or listening on podcasts, that you, you would say, if I asked you, where would you spend eternity? And you would say, I don't know. And the, the, Jesus came to answer that question, that you don't need to do anything to solve and answer that question. He did all the hard work. He lived the life that we should have lived. And then he died the death that we should have died. So that people like you, people like me, people who have made mistakes in our sexuality, made mistakes in our marriages, made mistakes just in life, we can be forgiven. That we are not our past. We are not our mistakes. We are not who the world says that we are. We are who God says that we are. God came to die for us so that we can be forgiven. This is the good news of Christianity. And that God loves you, dare I say, likes you. And he wants a relationship. That's what Christianity is about. Placing your faith in this God, beginning a relationship with him. Same way that I know my spouse and I talk to her, God wants to know you and speak with you. And if you feel that urge, that, that unction, something been, been speaking to you as I've been preaching, that's the Holy Spirit. He's the guy that's always in our midst. And he's been drawing you to him because he wants a relationship with you. Today is the day of your salvation. Would you just pray this prayer with me? God, I believe in you. God, I've been running for a long time and I didn't believe, but I really see that you do love us and you do care for us like a dad. And you didn't cancel us. You're not judging us. You're not angry with us. It was in love that you sent Jesus to die for me so that I could come home. I believe God. I want to receive your salvation. 
that was you this morning, we would love to celebrate with you. This is gonna be the best day of your life. From this moment on, you are gonna be a different person. And believe me, this church wants nothing from you. We just have a gift for you. Click the button, tell us who you are. We wanna help you, we wanna resource you, give you a Bible, give you a, 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 a plan on how to spend time with him, a book called Following Jesus. So you know how to start this relationship. And before I let you go, let me just tell you in two weeks, on December 6th, we are collecting our Vision Builders offering. I cast this vision on December, September 29th, our, our one, our year three vision, that we are going big, that even though Corona is shutting a lot of churches down, our church has been growing during this pandemic. That most churches are just trying to survive and we have been thriving. More people are in groups. More people are, are giving now than ever before. It's unreal because of your generosity, guys. Nine months, 37 weeks in this pandemic, our doors are still open. I can't say thank you enough for all your generosity for the last nine months, but the best is yet to come. And what God did is gonna do next year is I believe even bigger than we did this year. There will be a day where we will have two campuses every Sunday. And I'm hoping it's next Sunday that you're listening online, that, that we're in person and we're online. But I don't know, we may go back to red tier, we may not be meeting, but the vision I'm trying to cast to you is that we are trying to raise $100,000. And this is a vision to accelerate the growth, to ex expand the vision. This is not paying for the lights or for the salary. This is for the growth and the expansion of our church so we can reach more people, expand the reach of center set. And the pace of our church is the pace of your generosity. And there are so many of you that, that love this place. You love center set. You call this place home. It's time to partner with center set. And you don't partner merely by watching and coming to groups but you give God your tithes and offerings. Listen, you are never giving me, never giving center set your tithes and offerings. You're giving it to God through the local church. And I've never met anyone in the 15 years I've been a Christian, 10 years I've been a pastor, anyone who's ever regretted being generous to God. And this is an opportunity for us to position ourselves for massive growth next year. So let me pray, because in two weeks we're gonna bring that offering and it's gonna be amazing. Let me encourage you. We've already collected 5,000 out of the 100,000. People are already jumping on board, but let me pray for this. God, thank you so much for what you've done in our church for the last three years. It's miracle upon miracle upon miracle. And even though it looks dark and looks bleak, God, the promise still stands. That was the word that you gave this church on September 29th, that even though we're in a storm, you're sleeping in this storm because we're freaking out about things that don't freak you out, God. But by faith, we wanna bring our offering above and beyond our tithe, God, because we believe that the best is yet to come, that you're gonna expand this church. We reached 193 people, God, who said yes to Jesus for the first time in this church. We're believing for hundreds more in the coming years, that the best really is yet to come, God, that we are part of something bigger than ourselves, that we're part of a church that isn't just for us, God. It's for our kids. May we live a legacy that isn't just about us, but for others. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Be blessed, church. I love you. Have a great week. Hopefully, I'm preaching to you in person and online. Church, we hope that message left you feeling refreshed and encouraged to start a new week. Thank you for sharing your Sunday with us here at Center Set Church. We hope to see you next week or at our next in-person gathering. Be blessed, church.